Oh, Aloha Kiakua guys. Good morning. Um, some of you couldn't make it last night because to our Hebrew study, the third chapter, because we had flash flood warnings. It seems every week there's just something. Or maybe that's an excuse so you don't have to come down. But anyways, we're gonna we're gonna start this off, and I know some of you guys are watching from Wainiha and Princeville. So please bow your heads. Pop in heaven, we just uh, lift up this time to you as we're far apart in so many ways with but because of COVID hitting our community in the North Shore here with the weather, with the landslide, Lord, you have us in your grip. And these discomforts um, will weather because you are God and we love you. In your son's name, amen. So we're in Hebrews chapter three. So I want you to do something here uh, in a second. Um, well, first I want you to put on your, your Jewish believer hat. We've talked about that. Imagine you were born in the Jewish religious system. The years about 2,000 years ago, definitely before 70 AD, as we've talked about in our previous studies. You've given your life to Jesus and grace, freedom, mercy, they're all bouncing around. It's like, a, it's like puppy love. After a while though, you're, this new relationship, some of it is it's a little too much maybe. And you start returning to some of the familiar practices that in truth, Jesus Christ delivered you from. And the apostles are like, well, guys, by now you should be here, but you're kind of still here. And you're, you're drifting, as we talked about in the previous chapter. You're, you're drifting and you don't even know it. You're, you're starting to put rules down that aren't really the rules of the New Testament. And even those are the rules that you probably didn't follow so well back in the, the Torah, the Old Testament days anyways, but you really suck at it now. You're confusing religion, they're saying, with relationship. You're confusing culture with freedom in Christ. So they send a letter out. Um, we don't know who wrote it. We, sometimes we think it's Paul, Apollos, a lot of guys. We don't know. And maybe that's good because you can't point fingers, but well, you can still practice, whatever. So let's put it in perspective. Think of a tradition you used to believe in. Maybe it's infant baptism. I was baptized, don't remember it, and in the Presbyterian church. I don't, I don't I honestly don't remember it. Um, and as you delve deeper into scriptures, so later I became a Christian at 22, and it kind of seems that the intention of baptism was for a witness, and it's designed for people who have made a choice to follow Jesus. So you embrace that thought. You, you Maybe you're baptized like I was by a mentor. But then you have a child, and you remember all that pomp and circumstance. Well, you don't, but you've seen it, this pomp and circumstance. And you know, that's really cool. Let's get the family together. It's tradition. I get it. The error is when it becomes theological. Um, oh, this baptism will impart grace. This somehow saves the kid. You know, Jesus died for our sins. I know that in scripture, but I kind of missed the ceremony. So the writer or writers are just confirming this, this some, the same thing, that Jesus is superior to those traditions, the old law. And that word superior, greater than, above, angels, prophets, the law. And here in chapter 3, it's going to be Jesus is above Moses, their legend, their hero, the, the one who brought the Ten Commandments. So close your eyes. And I'm just going to read this as they would have heard it if it was written in English. So here you go. Close your eyes. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, Think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he is faithful to God, who appointed him, just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later on. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house, if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. That is why the Holy Spirit says this, Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There, your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them and I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. 
Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it who rebelled against God even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned whose corpses now lay in the wilderness? And to whom God was speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest. Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Okay, so everybody's in a different spot with scripture. Some are new Christians. So we're going to take a left turn here. That's left. And do a brief synopsis of Moses. Last night I was asking people about it. And some of this might be new, old, and some a reminder. And some is a little fun. So basically Moses. So according to the book of Exodus, Moses was born in a time when his people, the Israelites, an enslaved minority, were increasing in population. And as a result, the Egyptian pharaoh worried that they might ally themselves with Egypt's enemies. Moses' Hebrew mother secretly hid him when the the pharaoh ordered all newborn Hebrew boys to be killed in an order to reduce the population. So what happens here? Moses is in in Egypt. So uh, Joseph comes to Egypt. He gets sold into slavery. He comes in, and then later all his family follows him. And they grow, and they're doing great things. They become the the foundation of all the work. And pharaohs come, and they appreciate it. But one pharaoh comes, and he's not into it. He's like, I don't like these guys. They're different. They pray different. They dress different. I'm not into them. And we got to keep them down because they're going to take over. And so he starts putting some laws into place to kind of keep the population down. It's not working. So finally, he says, hey, toss the kids, toss the firstborn into the river, not into the Nile River. Let the river God have them. So basically Moses' mom, she takes takes him, puts him in a basket. She's not the only one. They're doing that. They're putting in themselves. And she has her daughter walk along the riverbank to kind of guide and direct it. And interestingly, Moses, I mean, Pharaoh's daughter finds, the princess finds it brings him in. Moses' sister runs up, hey, I got somebody that could take care of the baby for you because you're busy. So Moses' mom gets to raise him. In, so he came into Egypt in the high place, but also had his traditions of being a Jew. Later in his life, he's going to, he's raised out of a prince, he's going to see an altercation, an overseer of Egypt is beating the snot out of some um, Hebrew slaves. So he loses his temper and kills the overseer. And maybe he does it thinking they're going to rise up and come Let's go. Let's take over Egypt. Well, they don't. So he buries the body and kind of keeps it a secret. He's like, what? That that didn't work out. And later he sees two Hebrews fighting. He said, hey, hey, stop it. And they're like, hey, why? You're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? So the secret's out. So he takes off. So he goes out into Midian, into the desert, and he basically just goes in isolation. One day he's cruising through and there's this burning bush. And he's like, what the heck? That's a weird thing. It's not being consumed. It's just fire. And a voice comes from the bush. That's weird. And says, take off your shoes. This is a holy place. So Moses goes, okay, takes off his shoes. And the bush basically is God. I am who I am. And you are going to go and be my spokesperson and set my people free. And he's like, I don't want to. I don't speak very well. Which is an interesting side note. So we don't know a lot about Moses from birth to him killing the overseer to him being in... Uh, in the, the the desert in isolation so people like to add stuff in there like hey whatever you know let's let's make some some novels some stories up so a cute story it's not scripture but it's fun said that when moses was like three that he was playing with his grandfather the pharaoh i can't see that but whatever and he knocks the pharaoh's hat the the crown or whatever thing is and i don't know what he's wearing off onto the ground the Pharaoh like whoop, sees that as a sign, like, oh my gosh, this guy's a king toppler. He's gonna take out the kingdom, knock down the kingdom. And so they, they said, oh, bring in the magician, we'll have a test. So the whole time, the angel Michael, the archangel, is kind of guarding Moses. And again, this is legend. And so the test is there's a pile of gold and a pile of burning uh, embers. And so normally a kid would go for the shiny thing, but Michael kind of, moves 
um, Moses' little chubby hand over to the embers and he puts it in his mouth. And so Pharaoh is like, okay, the kid's not all there, grr, 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 so he can't, he'll never be able to topple a kingdom. So fast forward to this burning bush and Moses is like, I, I have a speech impediment. So some people say, it's because you put an ember in your mouth. That's just a side note, not truth, but funny. So God's like, don't worry, I'm gonna, I got your brother, Aaron, he's a high priest, coming in, you guys are gonna do it together. So basically Moses goes through and brings the Israelite, he has 10 plagues, each plague is designed to combat one of the, the deities of Egypt, the false deities. And finally, Pharaoh is hard, it's hardened, he's hard, he's mad, finally he's just like, get out of here, go, go. So Moses takes off and for three days and they reach the Red Sea. All of a sudden they look behind and Pharaoh's changed his mind. He's like, oh my gosh, there go all the workers. Who's gonna clean the toilets? Who's gonna do the agriculture? And so they, they go out to go get them back. The Israelites see that and they're like, this is horrible. You know, this is what's gonna happen. We're gonna die now. And the Red Sea, God gives them a miracle. <coughs> Excuse me, Red Sea parts. They go through, they evidence this, they're in it. They go through the Red Sea and the Pharaoh's army is like, well, let's go get them. And it wipes out his army. The Israelites see that. So they travel and they come to Canaan. So they come to Israel, what's today is. And they're looking, they send some spies and they come back and they're like, this place is too tough for us to take out. Okay, just a little bit ago, God took out the Egyptian army, which is the strongest army in the known time at that juncture. But they're like scared of, you know, there's fortified cities and they're scared of this and God just took care of this. So over that, God's like, you know what? Over this, now I'm simplifying it. You guys get back in the wilderness. This generation, you sissies, I'm gonna let you die off in the wilderness. This journey of 13 days to get to the promised land, Canaan, is now gonna take 40 years. So they just kind of go around in circles, kind of camp out by Mount Sinai and Horeb and, and some neat things happen there and some hard things. God is constantly evidencing how he loves them. Uh, imagine they're saying there's between 600,000 to 2 million. Nobody knows for sure, but a boatload of people. Well, not a boatload because it's a desert, but a lot of people. Now, it is a desert, so where's the water coming from? If you average two to four gallons of water per person per day to survive, that's a lot of water. Where's the food? It's like 15,000 tons of food a day for that many people, if it's a two million part. God provides. He sends manna from heaven, this, this bread substance that they're eating. They're like, I'm tired of this stuff. And the interesting thing about the manna, they had to gather it every day. They couldn't keep it for a week or next day. They had to gather it every single day. It would appear miraculously, which showcases, hey, it's a daily thing with the Lord. It's not like, hey, I'll just get my spiritual food on Sunday for an hour. No, he wants you to touch base in a sense. And that was what it's showing, that this is a relationship. So they gathered up, then like, we're sick of this. I understand that. I mean, I had beans and rice for months on end, and I was getting kind of tired of beans and rice. So God sends quail, and they stuff themselves with quail. And they were sick of this, but they're constantly complaining. And it's kind of ticking God off. God sends them some commandments, sets up some rules that separate them. I have my hand on you, he's saying. I'm making you a separate people. It's not because you're so tall or awesome or smart. <clears throat> it's just that I've chosen you. You dress different, eat different, and you're gonna be a light to the generations. Yeah, they weren't. So long story, Moses is included in dying in, in the desert. He is included in that generation. He thought he wasn't, then he screwed up. He did something, he disobeyed God, and it seemed a minor way, but long story is that generation dies off. But Moses is huge. He is the Paul Bunyan, he's the Davy Crockett in American history, he's the George Washington, really. He's the one who brought the law. He's huge. And it says in Numbers 12, three, I would love that to said about me. There hath not risen a prophet, I'm doing this out of the King James because I just want to say hath. There hath not risen a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses. There's nobody like Moses whom Yahweh, whom God knew face to face. So here we have Hebrews chapter three. And we're making a, a little shift in topic. The first two chapters were mostly about how Jesus Christ is superior to what? To the angels, right? Angels are huge in the in Israel, in the, in the land, and they, they kind of added some stuff on there that God didn't really intend, but that's what people do. So, and then it also talked in chapter two about how Jesus is fully human, 
And this is what allows him to be our ultimate example, the high priest and the captain of our salvation, because he truly understands. The term is Kohen Gadol, the high priest, Hebrews 2.10. Here, now the subject goes on to explain how Jesus is going to be superior to the Old Testament figures such as Moses. According to this chapter, Moses' works were important. We just read that. But don't compare that to Jesus. It's, it's mice and elephants. Like a house, Moses was a created thing. Jesus wasn't. Jesus was the builder of all things, including the house, and he's worth more glory and honor. Moses pointed to great things, which God would do, but Jesus Christ actually did those things. Moses was a powerful and faithful servant in the household of God, but Jesus is the son, the firstborn son in the house of God. That's big time in that culture. Driving the analogy home, the author of Hebrews now gives the next warning to Christians, and this is our application. He uses the incident of Israel's failure to trust God, which resulted in them just cruising around the desert for 40 years. And he, he explains how, hey, they came to the border of the promised land and then lost faith. So instead of trusting God for victory, they doubted they could defeat the giants of, of Canaan, of the promised land. And as a result, God's like, oh my gosh. Okay, I, God probably didn't do that, but he's just, he disciplined the nation. He's got, I got, I got plans for you. I had plans for you. You didn't figure that one out, but now I have plans for you. So he disciplined them. All but a small remnant would wander the desert till they died. They would never see the ultimate victory that God has offered. Now, this kind of doubt is what the application is. It doesn't imply a loss of salvation. It's like the, the, the Israelites didn't just go to the promised land. Oh, we doubt God is even there. He, they're, they're not saying that. He just doubts that God's got his hands in their lives. It's, it's a salvation in the book of Exodus. It starts, like when we, we think salvation is when we come to Jesus, maybe we're at church, raise your hand, go forward, you're according to tradition, you're in your room. Like I was, you just, Lord, come into me. Holy Spirit, come down because I need you. I can't do my, this life thing myself. I totally understand. Well, I don't understand, but I totally accept your sacrifice for what you did for me on the cross. And so for them, salvation was represented by the Passover escape, that when they left Egypt, that was their salvation. They were out of that land. They were called out. They were to enter into God's rest. That word rest is a huge word in, in, in Hebrew. And God didn't say, when they doubted, he didn't say, okay, just beat it. I'm over this. I'll try somebody else. I'll go down to the Zulus. They're kind of cool looking. Instead, he withheld them from the victory of entering the promised land. And that's the same way Canaan, the promised land is not a metaphor for heaven here. It's, there's, in fact, when Joshua later goes over, if that's heaven, heaven sucks. They're fighting. They're fighting the giants. They're fighting AI. That's a, we're going to talk about that Sunday. There's struggles to experience. And, and even for those who hold on to their faith, it's like, this is, this, is a, this is not heaven. This is the Christian walk. So it's not a loss of salvation they're talking about here in Hebrews. It's a loss of fellowship, a loss of reward. And our spiritual inheritance, which occurs when we doubt God's word. To finish, I was thinking of this with the, the story of Lazarus. I know, you're like, how's he going over here? Well, remember the story of Lazarus. For Jesus... He loves these people. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, their brother. In fact, Martha's like the workhorse. She's always doing stuff or cooking for all the apostles, all the people. She's like the, the lady that owns the green pig in, for Puka's church. She's always cooking. And Mary's sitting at his feet, just absorbing. She's like his stellar student. And Lazarus was special to him. Well, Jesus says some days away and, and Lazarus gets sick and it's a bad one. They're worried. And so they send word to him, say, hey, you're your brother in a sense, your, your friend Lazarus is sick, can you please come? And it says, Jesus tarries. It's a cool word. I am going to use that word today. I'm going to tarry at the beach. And so for four days. So Lazarus dies the first day. He pow. And so Jesus comes and Mary and Martha see him. And now Lazarus has been in the grave for three days. And they're like, Lord, if you were here, you could have saved him. And some people look at that, look how cool, they, they recognize his power, that he could have done something miraculous. And yeah, they're also pissed. Like, Lord, if you were here, you could have saved him. They recognize his power, but pissed that it didn't fit their personal agenda. But God looks at the big picture. Jesus goes, open the tomb. They're like, we don't want to open the tomb. He's been there for three days. Lord, 
great King James, sometimes he stinketh. He stinketh, Lord. I'm going to tarry because I stinketh. No. But anyways, but that's they're like, he's dead. He's not a little dead, like the prince's bride. He's dead, dead, like three days rotting dead. And Lazarus come forth. And he showed the power. Yes, he could have gone and healed. Run over there. Boop, 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 boop. Sprinkle some Jesus dust. And Lazarus, you know, his COVID is, is done. He's like, oh, I'm better. Here, he shows ultimate power. God looks at the big picture. It allowed him to do much, much more. Yes, there's some, some feelings of pain. But you know what? Wiped away. The tears are wiped away. Lazarus comes forward. So the warning here is about disappointment with God. You just have to trust that he has the whole picture in mind, not just our puzzle piece that we hold. I am seeing him add pieces here. I don't have a complete picture, but he's leading you all here for this season. This is what I was sharing last night. I have a, a group I meet with, and last Friday was evidenced dramatically how God has all led us together for a season, a season of bright ministry. And these, the five of us meet, um, it was four, now it grows by one by one. And it's weekly, they're all pastors or chaplains or in offices of authority. And it's just a place for us to pray and love each other, to go out and do ministry. And then I look at our church, who God is leading here, and has had people here already just waiting to explode, explode and love this community. But before we love this community, we have to have our foundation set. We have to know what Jesus teaches, and we have to know what Scripture is all about, oh, because ultimately it'll be our words. And our words don't save anybody. Our words might be nice. They might make them feel good for a second. It's like giving a lunch to a homeless guy. He feels good for an hour or two. But guess what? These words are eternal. His bread is eternal. His water, the living water, is eternal. So pray on that. God bless you. Hope to see you Sunday. And we'll continue in Luke chapter 11. And I love you guys. Aloha kia kua. Amen.